suit up, strap in, warm the tires, and leave on yellow. Time for the Mitsu Times Podcast. Presented by MitsuTimes.org, the home of the fastest Mitsubishi cars. With your host, Josh. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Josh from Mitsu Times. Today, my guest is Mr. Andrew Welling. He is the owner-operator at Tau Performance Engineering. How are you doing today, sir? Doing pretty good, Josh. Great. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm glad that's warming up. I hope the cold weather is behind us. I'm, I'm sick of seeing snow. I know you, you probably yeah, got it think... worse up there. Yeah, we're not out of the woods yet. We got <laughs> we got some freezing rain coming apparently this week, so... Looks like it's about to be pretty bad. Looks like 40s and 50s for us. So I, I'm, I'll take it. <laughs> Lucky. So, Andrew, I, you know, I'm so curious where the name Tau Performance Engineering comes from because, uh, as a super nerd myself, someone who plays Warhammer 40K, is that where you got the name from, or did it come from somewhere else? No, no, it's really not that deep. It's, uh, it kind of just stemmed from uh, my my engineering background and. Uh, kind of being a math nerd, so gotcha. Tau's the uh, right the Greek letter for torque when you do all of your physics calculations. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that's good. So, I, I was hoping you weren't. Uh, if anybody out there is listening, plays forty k, we were going to judge you if that's where you got it from. <laughs> so, Andrew, uh, first off, I got to start off by saying thank you for coming on as a sponsor for. Uh, half of last year, this year for the, uh, the new W4833 and the F4833 class, because, uh, it seems like it's, it's really, uh, woken people up to try to get to a, a top of a new list. Yeah, for sure. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, again, I like seeing, uh, like seeing what's going on with the list and, and helping people, uh, kind of help divide things up a little bit. So, uh, you know, I was actually, <clears throat> listening to your uh your last episode there with with nick and talking about those list breakdowns and it, it, it was interesting because there were some things i agreed with and some things that i didn't so it's kind of cool to hear everybody else's thoughts and um you know put this list out there for people to kind of hone in on you know one uh i'll say one major point of of uh description i guess 2024 is is going to be a year of people getting mad at list <laughs> I can see I can see that. I yeah. can see that. It's uh it's going to it's going to get interesting, but I I'm here for it. I don't mind being the uh the Roger Goodell, you know, coming out to to do the draft and, and get booed. That's that's fine with me. <laughs> Somebody's got to be the bad guy, right? Yeah, exactly. So Andrew, let's start off with uh telling us about yourself and your background with Mitsubishi cars. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been, I've been messing around with, with cars and, and performance stuff forever. I mean, my dad works the dealership life. Um, was around a lot of domestic cars growing up. Um, you know, when I was really young, he worked at the local Buick dealer at a 74 Nova small block fats and skinnies. Nice. You know, he daily drove that. Um, and I, I just remember, you know, him ripping gears and that thing as a kid, I was, you know, sitting up in the front seat, which obviously isn't kosher these days, but, um, <laughs> you know, I learned I learned a lot from you know from him, like wrench tosses and magic four letter words. But um, in in the nineties, he switched to uh, work at the Chrysler dealer, and and I remember seeing uh, you know two GB Talon there in the showroom, right next to a, a Dodge Viper, which you know at the time didn't make any any sense to me, right? But um, <laughs> but I actually used to ride in that that Viper, which hooked me on performance. I mean, that thing's yeah. like my forever guilty pleasure car. So, uh, but fast forward a little bit when I was in high school, you know, I got my license and, and picked up a car for my uncle and, uh, it needed some work, but I was like, man, the thing's got a five liter V8 in it, right? This thing's awesome. I don't care if it's in an 86 Cougar, but, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that car wasn't worth the squeeze. So <laughs> got, got rid of it. Um, and, uh, while I was working my first job, beating meat at a butcher shop, um, picked up a, a 90 prelude S. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, super, super slow, but you know, at like 7,000 RPM, it sounded fast, but, uh, had that car for five months, you know, and, and was like, all right, you know, I'm a teenage kid. I want to go fast. This isn't doing it. So let's find something we can like turbo or 
something. So for some reason started shopping for two forties and, uh, that didn't really last long. Cause then I stumbled upon a one G GST and couldn't, couldn't live without it. So yeah. that, that's kind of where everything that everything went south. So that was, that was the spark. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was 2005. So seems like yesterday, man, but, uh, about that same time, um, when I was picking up that, that eclipse, um, started my junior year of high school and I was working, a or started a vocational tech program that we had there. Um, began taking automotive classes for half my day and I, and I fell in love with it. So I knew I wanted to make a career out of automotive in some capacity. So during that time, I was, uh, actually chosen to participate in a program called automotive youth education systems, AYES. Um, so it's a, it's a, I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's a prestigious national internship program that puts high schoolers in service shops for credit. Wow. So I, I immediately jumped on that, that train, right? Took that opportunity, uh, went through the interview process and, and landed with a, a, a Toyota dealer, very, a very good Toyota dealer um, in our area. So I had started working there the summer before my senior year. So this would have been uh, June of 06. And, uh, you know, I was working half the day. I was going to school the first half of the day, working the rest of the day, basically like noon to you know five thirty or whatever. Um, and once I graduated, I was offered a full time position at at the Toyota dealer as a line tech. So the caveat was I had to get my associate's degree. Oh. Um, so that's what I that's what I did. I started taking classes at night. I was wrenching five six days a week, um, but that really shaped you know my work ethic. But at the same time, it kind of it kind of left a hole in me because I I love pers- performance so much. And seeing things that we were doing at, you know, at the tech school and then going into the dealership life, it was like, I want to do some more, some more cool things with cars. Yeah. So another guy that I worked with, he was also an AYS grad. Um, he had started, he and I kind of started working on stuff late at night out of our garages. Um, that kind of birthed our, our first side gig, which was uh, conveniently or, or quirkily named AE Tuning. Um, me being the A and my, my buddy <laughs> Eric Hazen being the uh e so eric actually he, he owns a, a very successful motorsports business now called varus engineering um, oh, wow. in indianapolis but together we you know we were i mean eric had a welder he was self-taught he was awesome so he was doing you know welding up cages exhaust manifolds you know i was doing some tuning um engine and transmission builds i mean anything we could get our hands on we were we were trying to do for for people in our area so um, Eric was more of a Toyota performance guy. I was more of the Mitsubishi performance. Um, he had an MR2, turbo MR2. It was like, he was like a 94, if I remember right. Um, nice. by that, by this point, I had already had two DSMs, front wheel drive and all wheel drive. Um, but by 2011, I was working on, you know, most of the DSMs in the area, you know, head gasket replacements, cam upgrades, you know, basic ECU setups and tuning. So of course I'm talking like super airflow converters, math translators. Right. Um, I was handy with AM, EMS. Eric and I both ran that uh, in our cars. So we kind of got into standalone stuff pretty early on, kind of skipped the whole like ECM link area, just jumped jumped right in. Um, but we were, riding, we were riding a high. So Eric was going to school for engineering, and I was graduating from automotive tech school. And, and professionally, we were kind of growing apart a little bit. Mm-hmm. So... Eric had moved out of town to pursue his professional motorsports career, and I was kind of stuck at the dealership. Um, but this eventually drove me to slow down on on the side gig stuff, and I um, actually decided to go back to school for for engineering to try to, you know, see if I could pursue that path. Yeah. Um, again, I knew I had a, a, a real vested interest in developing parts and wanted to learn why and how, and and was using my own you know talent as as a test bed. So ultimately, um, I ended up actually getting a job with a company called Eaton, where I started as an R&D lab technician in their commercial vehicle clutch lab, test lab. Wow. Uh, and they supported me going to engineering school, which was which was huge, right? That was a, a pivotal point um, in my, my career, my life, really. Um, but at that point, right, I have this race car that I want to make parts for. I've got a full engineering <laughs> lab with tools and equipment you know, anything I could think of and, and schooling that's provoking thought every single day and me who just wanted to go fast, right? It's like the perfect storm. <laughs> but this really pushed me to continue to learn and grow. And ultimately, I graduated my bachelor's in mechanical engineering and, and took a role as a product development engineer with Eaton's Automotive Driveline, Driveline Group. 
Nice. Um, which is where I still work at to this day. So that's that's the day job. Um, but you know, this whole progression is honestly what shaped me and and my involvement with Mitsubishi's and continues to not only push myself but try to help push the entire platform forward. Right, kind of drove the creation of of Tau Performance Engineering. Definitely uh, connected the dots here. Yeah, it all, all I said it all kind of comes full, full circle when you you know looking back at it and, and kind of reflecting. It's like wow, this was this was definitely not the road that I had pictured, but I'm I'm not mad at it either. Yeah, wouldn't go back and change it. Definitely not. So Andrew, how, when, and why did Tau Performance Engineering get started after all this? Um. Yeah, I mean, technically, you know, TP wasn't documented as started until September-ish of 2019. Um, like I said, that's really kind of the culmination of what I was doing with this AE tuning stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the late 2000s, early 2010s, that was morphing into, you know, more technically advancing product development type of work, right? So originally started the page on Facebook as just an outlet to share what I was doing on my car and the things that... Um, I was doing to and making to make it fast. Um, and if you recall, right, Josh, interview we had before about me and my car, right? I bought that DSM and the current one in 2015. Yeah. Um, which is when I decided to switch from manual drivetrain racing and all the headaches of that to auto magic. Um, and I was you know, learning about the auto transmissions along with how to set up an auto dry car from converter operation to specking. Um, engine tuning for launching, you know, just the resulting drive line effects downstream, right? It was all at that point it was I me mean, all new to me. So, you know, I was tackling this myself and leveraging other companies for help when I was building up my car, which, you know, took a few years. Um, I mean, it was three years before I had the car, you know, kind of settled out and, and running and, and trying to, to shake it down. So, um, you know, there was a lot of major hiccups and learnings on that, but so it was, important learnings. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, the spring of 19, before I had that, had the car to a point where I was ready to tackle my goal of being 950 index competitive. And um, that's kind of when I decided that all the work and development and part making, et cetera, was um, that I was doing to the car needed, needed, just needed an outlet to share it all, right? I wanted to be able to bring this to um, kind of everybody in, in the community and, you know, not not try to cover things up right i'm not a huge fan of um of keeping secrets right. for the most part so but that kind of birthed tpe right again solely as an outlet to share what i was what i was doing so as things marched on um you know COVID hit and i used you know that time stuck at home to kind of really start drafting and fabricating fabricating parts to sell uh, you know specifically for the dsm transmissions because that's what i had, had spent the most time in you know really hands-on so again with my profession of being in the automotive oem driveline field it was a natural fit progression i guess you could say so you know i was utilizing the equipment i had at home um to offer up products and and services to you know our local racers too so um you know i've got my own 3d printer for instance um i also have access to to a few others you know fdm and sla style um, you know, access to 3D scanner, um, have my own CAD software. So, you know, I was drawing and printing prototypes for myself and others and even making usable parts, um, you know, from 3D prints. Yeah. So, but that turning point was when, um, the turning point was when I was caught up in a discussion about valve bodies on one of the auto DSM Facebook groups. Um, I was sharing some of my info and parts that I had made to perform at the time, um, the Kigley valve body mods that he shared back in like 2014, 2015, the tech seminars at the shootout. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was catching some attention from some of the other racers. And they began messaging me about like, Hey, you know, are you going to like make these? Are you going to put kits together? Are you, are you going to do rebuild services? Like, you know, I would love to get this done. I'm just not comfortable messing around with a valve body. Right. Um, so this was like around early 2021, summer 21. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll entertain it. So I kind of put a feeler out about, you know, well, if, if I do this, I probably have to do a group buy, you know, just to kind of get things rolling here. Yeah, for sure. Um, and not get too upside down on things. 
But, uh, you know, to, to, to make this group buy for parts to perform these modifications for those who didn't want to fabricate themselves. And, I mean, it got a ton of attention. And ultimately, it, it really took off from there. So it was kind of like a, a springboard, I guess, to making um, TPE a little more of a structured, uh, you know, business, you could say. And I know it's got to be confusing for the manual guys out there, for uh, even auto guys who've never taken apart the valve body. I, I think it's it, it's you, you don't it's stuff that you don't see right. It's those tiny little springs, the little tiny ball bearings. It's all that stuff that makes that valve body so complicated that people don't want to do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really um, it, it's kind of a niche, right? So. It's kind of the uh, the mechanical brain of the automatic, right? Yeah. So even though it's an electronic um, shifted transmission, all your cylinders are really doing is a, is allowing for pressure to bleed off of certain circuits, right? And when that happens, that causes uh, you know pressure to change on different shuttle valves, and then when once that changes, now those valves can move, and then that flow can now be redirected to another right circuit within the transmission so it's it's it sounds really complicated um and and you know there are people that definitely you know struggle with it um and sometimes i can sit down with people and show them a hydraulic schematic like okay look this is what we're doing this is what we're changing this is you know why you're seeing you know like converter pressure for instance you know this is why it's high or why it's low or um but it's definitely um it's definitely hard to, even if you have parts in hand, it's still kind of hard to explain to people exactly what's happening inside of this, you know, this black box type of unit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I can understand the appeal of wanting to send it off and not do it yourself because even, you know, the, the kits that they used to sell, I'm not sure if they still do where you could do it yourself. Even those sometimes instructions weren't very clear or, you know, the, the, parts that came with it were hit and miss. So um, it, it's great that you stepped up and really filled the, the niche for this particular market. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the, the trans lab kit is probably the most, the most common, right? Um, it's, it's pretty cost effective. It's easy to get your hands on. Um, and, and yeah, there's definitely people that struggle, you know, with the instructions. And at the end of the day, it's also meant for multiple, um, transmissions within the km series family right yeah. so if you're not 100 percent sure what you're looking at you can definitely get yourself in trouble pretty quickly or even just something as simple as drilling the wrong hole in the orifice plate can, can you know wreak havoc yeah. so and, and the problem with something like that is you wouldn't even know until you got it all back together it, it, right right there's not really a good uh way to bench test it you know before you put it back in vehicle yeah. so it's it's the I put it in and, and all of a sudden I don't you know I don't have forward gears or you know I lost reverse or you know things like that that just it, it's it's hard for people right and it scares them a lot of times yeah understand understandably yeah for sure so Andrew what products and services does Tau Performance Engineering offer and for what Mitsubishi platforms um yeah so. You know, with TP really just being a you know a second job for me, I do pick and choose carefully what I what I tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that being said, I primarily offer product design development services, and that's not necessarily Mitsubishi specific. Um, you know, the shift kits have stirred everything up um, and become a, a regular product offering that I do keep in stock as much as possible. Um, so there there are variations to that. So you know, there's a quote unquote street style, I guess you could call it, um, which which is really just a um, you know, a four speed, a four speed offering to kind of uh, correct some of the nuances of of these transmissions and up the pressure a little bit, all the way up through what I call the the three speed drag only offering, um, and anything in between. So, I mean, I do have my shift kits offered as a as a DIY install with you know some pretty detailed instructions. It's it's pretty thick, and I've gotten some feedback on, you know, hey, it, it's kind of a lot, but at the same time, it's it. Uh, it steps through, you know, valve by valve, mm -hmm. what you should be doing, right? Um, there's things in there about what you should look for. Um, and obviously, I'm I'm all about support. So even if you are doing a DIY, I will still 
help you through that install if you run into problems. Um, but again, for those that just don't even want to tackle it, I do have um, the rebuild service where you can send me in your valve body and I can perform the installation of the kit for you. Oh, wow. So, you know, the primary platform supported our, you know, DSM and, and 3Ss that have, um, you know, the F and W4833 transmissions, um, their valve bodies. I do still dabble with manual transmissions, um, especially for, you know, locals. Um, I have been asked about full automatic transmission rebuilds. Um, I, I don't have the space or the time to tackle that yeah. a lot. Um, I, you know, I do have, I'll say the, uh, the buddy approach here, some guys that I take care of that I do help them out with that. But again, we're talking loose time constraints yeah. <laughs> to, to work through all of that. You can't so, pile up 20 transmissions. No, I, yeah, I can't, can't take that on, but, um, I try to focus on again, the, uh, you know, the products and, and, um, you know, more of the design service as much as I can. So, um, but I do have, uh, some customers that are running kits in auto swapped Evos internationally, which is pretty neat. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've not had a lot of contact with, uh, you know, some of the Mitsu crowd internationally up until I, I start doing this. So it was, it's pretty neat to, to meet some of these guys and, and see some of their projects and, you know, get some of their data to review. And it's like, wow, this is, this is awesome. For sure. So, but like I mentioned though, you know, most of my efforts put into developing solutions to problems, right? Whether it's reproducing an OEM part that's obsolete um, or trying to create more robust parts for, for you know, failures or continuous problems, um, or even just designing and creating a single part for a grassroots racer who needs help. You know, I, I'm not, um, I'm not picky, but I am picky. If that makes sense, <laughs> you know? So if it, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I need to have 20 parts before I'll, I'll make this. Like, no, if you're, you know, if you're a grassroots racer and you, uh, you, you just need something, you don't have design capability or printing capability or, you know, even if it needs to be made out of metal, right, I can get, I can get stuff machined up. That, that's not a problem, right? If we're willing to figure this problem out, let's do it. Yeah. Get so, back I mean, on track. Yep. I mean, an example I have, you know, I've designed and printed prototypes for, um, a suspension bracket for a company here locally um, that they do fabrication of long travel suspension for uh, big power rear wheel drive cars. Oh, wow. So, you know, they've got the design ideas, they have the fab ability, but they wanted, you know, quick turnaround iterations and fitment checks. So, you know, work together to, to make that happen, right? Um, I got a project that I, I've started for, uh, you know, private label designing and adjustable cam gear for a niche Subaru naturally aspirated application. Um, for an engine builder, because oh. none of the came in, none of the cam manufacturers would take it on, because it's just too low volume for them to even mess with. So you know, I'm, this type of stuff is where I, I feel like it can make an impact, right? Sometimes that small that small little thing it can turn into something bigger, right? For and that sure. that'd be great if it does, and if it doesn't, at least somebody got their problem fixed that they were facing today, right? So, you know, I say the best thing someone can do is just reach out to me, discuss what you have, um, you know, and I can kind of give you a thumbs up, take it on, or give you advice or a contact who might be able to help you out, you know, better. You know, that seems like a loss of business to me, but really it's, it makes the community stronger, right? That's, that's really a win for everyone in my book. Absolutely. That's, that's really what we need. So Andrew, I want to go into a little more, more depth about these, uh, valve body products that you offer for the F4833 and the W4833 because that's that's probably the people who are listening that's what they're going to be most interested in I'm assuming yeah for sure so yeah I mean these the valve body products and service you know for these F and W4833 transmissions it's it's quite extensive and that was never actually the plan at the beginning uh, but it's kind of warped into that what well, started as just parts to perform the solenoid removal and shuttle valve blocking, right? So to take a trans lab equipped valve body and make it a three speed drag race valve body yeah. um, has, has been that and now more. So uh, for the kits, I put together a few offerings um, kind of alluded to earlier, right? The basic being uh, what I just call a tear down inspection and cleaning or winter service where I'll take the valve body, um, no matter the level of performance that it, that it's being used for, and just inspect it, 
check solenoids for proper operation um, under pressure, you know, electrical resistance, um, check for valve cleanliness, make sure there's nothing sticking. Um, that's, that's kind of a problem that's hard to find is, you know, you can, uh, you can have a valve that clicks when it's just sitting on the bench. And then as soon as you put pressure on it, it can stick. Yeah. Um, so you try to find those things. So that way you're not fighting issues down the road. Right. Um, look for scored shuttle valves or valve bores um, and re- recondition if needed. Um, that's, that's real, right? Debris is, is a big factor. Um, you know, the oil that you're using, if you're burning up oil, right? Converter overheats and you burn up oil and you're still running old oil, that kind of stuff can all contribute to issues in valve bodies. Um, you know, for instance, Troy Wallace had an issue with his car, um, where he was getting low pressure in third. And I mean, like, it's like 60 PSI. I want to say it was really, really low pressure wow. in third. Um, after the two, three shift. <clears throat> so it did, you know, he sent it in and did a tear down and found there was some, some light scoring on the two, three shift shuttle valve, um, and that bore, and it was actually causing the valve to only move about 60% of its stroke and then it would stick. Wow. So, so basically it was, it was trying to split pressure as if you were in second and third gear. It's kind of the best way to describe it. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean that that was able to take care of you know his problem. He ended up going ahead and, and doing some other modifications while we had it, and and got him got him uh, pumped up a bit with uh, a little better valve body setup for what power his car was making and what he's racing, you know, um, uh, doing with the car. So you know the winter service is a great way to get you know peace of mind for things that are getting ready for spring, or if you've had a trans failure, um, just want your valve body gone through. Um, Again, it's it's not not a whole lot, right? We're only talking, you know, hundred and twenty five dollars plus shipping and I'll sit there and use a pick to pick debris out of your valve body. So so yeah, so I guess the next level uh, up you could say I call it the the street kit, um which is similar to what you get with kind of like the trans lab kit, but with some additional instructions for supporting modifications. Um, you know, including like porting your oil pump inlet, for instance, where the main filter mounts. Um, you know, trans life kit's not going to tell you to, to do that. Right. right. But, um, that kind of stuff is kind of part of that, that shift kit. Um, but it comes with, you know, the tools that you need for modifying, um, the orifices in the channel plate, um, you know, springs for the appropriate shuttle valves that you need to change out, um, uh, replacing the steel flow check balls with Teflon, um, that kind of stuff. So, you know, that, that Teflon check steel check ball one is, is kind of interesting because, right, those, uh, you know, the balls have a certain mass. However, like the line relief, for instance, line pressure relief check ball, check ball um, over time, that thing bounces mm-hmm. on the orifice plate and it actually can, you know, wear through. Oh, wow. Um, I've, I've seen some pretty bad ones where the ball is like almost all the way through the plate. <laughs> so... You know, that affects the spring load of the ball on the seat. Um, if it's moving around enough, it cannot sit flat on the seat. So then you're getting pressure bleed off right there, right? And it's just, that kind of stuff adds up. So, um, but yeah, anyway, it's, the, it really is a great kit. It gets you, you know, right around 180 PSI line pressure or so. <laughs> Again, depending on your transmission and um, getting everything squared away. So... Um, you still maintain your factory style trans operation for, you know, for most people, this is a really solid kit and you can make a lot of horsepower and go fast on it. Um, yeah. Don't, don't think that it's, it's not, you know, good enough for your, you know, 700 horsepower car. Cause it, it really still is. Like you can still do a lot with it. So um, again, and not only do I offer that shift kit to install yourself, but um also install the kit and perform the sporting modifications for you. Okay. So, um, again, offered as DIY install or as the, the full service. Heck yeah. And that same service includes the thorough cleaning and inspection of your valve body prior to installing anything, right? You got to make sure you have a good core to start with. So like I said, I talked about the, the separator plate. That's a, that's a really common finding that I have, mm-hmm. um, that those, those holes start to get, you know, wallered out a bit. So again, this can become pretty problematic. Um, 
that also occurs even on the lower valve body plate. So I know a lot of people are pretty, I guess, aware of, or at least that I've talked to, of the main separator plate, but yeah. you can get the same thing occurring with the rear clutch exhaust check ball on the, on the lower valve body plate as well. Um, but yeah, any flow that's not going to, to a necessary place is just being wasted, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the pump can only give so much, and if you're losing that flow, um, I, I think you, you might have seen, Josh, because you, you have an auto trans, right? In yes, your sir. So IPT released that video about that um, um, bushing, right? Yep. For the end clutch shaft, which was, it's great, right? Because you're like, look, anytime that you have oil that's not going where it's supposed to go, <laughs> that's a problem, right? <laughs> so anyway, I've, I've digressed a little bit. Um <laughs> So the next step up, um, kind of the, I guess, top of the line, you could call it, is the, the drag-only shift kit, um, which it's it's really a, a single kit that you can adopt, uh, adapt to be used as four-speed or three-speed. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of early on, that was a discussion where everybody was like, well, hey, I'm making 900,000 horsepower, but I want to retain fourth gear. And it's like, yeah, you can do that. You know, full disclosure, though, anytime you're going to hit high boost in fourth gear, you're, you're asking for trouble. We've, we've all established that, right? Yeah. Whether the end clutch goes or you snap an input shaft or, you know, it's it's up to you, right? But you can absolutely maintain it, right? I know, you know, Tony, for instance, right, with his, his drag and drive uh, 2G, right, he still has fourth gear operation, and we know that car makes a ton of horsepower. Right, yeah, for sure. Um, but again, you can, you can do things to make that work right you just have to be cognizant of it so um but these kits are by far the most common for me right it was the first offering to the community like this for these transmissions um and again these kits include all of or none of the hardware associated with the street kit and what i mean by that is um i offer this as a full shift kit which is meant to be installed on a valve body that is um fully stock mm -hmm. to begin with um, or you can get as a parts only kit, which is meant for a valve body that either has one of my street kits installed, or if you've done a trans lab kit install, um, you can, you can put it in on top of that. Right. So this includes, um, with this includes beyond the typical shift kit offering is the two block off plates that are used to take the place of the factory pressure regulator solenoid, which is no longer used when you perform a uh, direct solenoid wiring approach like Kigley's ratchet shifter wiring. Yeah. Um, or if you use an ECU to control the shifts, like uh, Haltech or FuelTech. Um, and then for like 2Gs, uh, you have the converter clutch lockup or DCC solenoid um, that gets blocked off. Now, 1Gs don't have this, but I do include it in all the kits. For one, it's easier for me to just make one kit right. and not try to separate things out. Um, and, and really, there's not a major cost impact at this, at this point, right? Um but you can still install it for aesthetics, right? That port is still there. The bolts are there. Um, you know, one G's have a steel strap, the aluminum block off plate. It's about the same mass. So it's not, you know, not really hurting anything to mm -hmm. put it in there. You need something bolted down though. Right. So you can do it either way. Um, you know, in the past though, people have, have welded those factory solenoids shut. Um, that was kind of the, the norm. Um, but I created these plates to save from one damaging any more factory parts than what we need to. <laughs> um, you know, they use an off the shelf style O ring um, as opposed to the factory ceiling. So, you know, the advantage there is, and again, you're not trying to chase down factory seals or anything like that. Right. right? Um, and I know Aaron's recently done the same, um, with his valve bodies, you know, he's offering uh, block off plates as well. Um, so again, I think he's, he's taking the same approach too, right. Of, of not welding shut solenoids anymore. We don't have to. Yeah. Um, and then along with those plates, there's six shuttle valve spring stops. So these replace springs for specific valves that don't move in a drag race trans. Um, and using all six creates the three speed. Oh, okay. Um, leaving two of them out is, and that's all defined in the instructions, allows you to retain fourth gear, but still have all those performance gains of the full drag race transmission. So, um, again, if you, if you want to retain fourth, cause it is still a street driven car, you can still have 
all this performance and still have the operation. Um, if you don't want to have the concerns of fourth gear or even a chance to accidentally engage fourth gear under boost, right? You can you can make the valve body um, only operate as a three speed. Wow. So again, this the reason for all this is solely to maintain flow from the pump and use it to its fullest. So you know it's been shown by you know. Kevin, Kigley, and, and many others, the sensitivity to oil pressure and flow on these transmissions, you know, especially at high horsepower. Um, you know, one thing that can happen is when line pressure gets cranked up, for instance, you know, values of 230, 250, um, I've seen 270. You know, these these circuits within the valve body are seeing much higher pressure than they're used to. And when <laughs> you have firm shifts that occur, you know, when you get those quick shuttle valve movements, those pulses internally can cause the valves that aren't moving to bounce and, and leak and can cause bleed off. Mm. Um, and this becomes problematic when you need, you know, every PSI in your front clutch to maintain torque capacity in yeah. third gear. We know that's that's the weakest the weakest uh, gear. So, um, but also these valve restrictions allow you to utilize the RD port mod, which uh, means when you take the flow from the reducing pressure circuit, which is no longer being used when you modify the valve body like this, um, and direct that to the transmission rear lube circuit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what lubes the planetary gears. So obviously we're all, we're all growing very sensitive of these planetary gears. Yes, um, anybody that's an auto guy is, knows either they've personally have broke them or they've witnessed all the fast guys breaking them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely our next big challenge. Um, but again, when, when you do these, when you do this, for instance, the, a new problem is created, right? With these changes. So if you perform these valve pinning modifications and you don't monitor your transmission pressures, especially your DA port or your converter charge pressure, you can generate enough converter pressure to cause early wear of your crank thrust bearings. Mm. So, um, the opposite is if you perform the RD part mod and you don't pin, or run high enough spring load on your reducing pressure valve, you can. this can cause low converter pressure charge. Um, so then this creates a converter that doesn't stall up properly or has a high you know, slip ratio. But ideally, my drag-only shift kit coupled with the RD port mod and a pressure control valve on your cooler line can create a really solid way to max without sacrificing your converter pressure or planetary loop flow. So um, again, these, these top-end kits have an option for installation service. Um, and, you know, I can talk you through uh, what's going to be the best combination, right? What types of pressures maybe should we be targeting and how we how we get it there? Um, yeah, that's that's really the the breakdown there of of the shift kits and, and the valve body work. So you got everybody covered from from street cars to race cars. I, I try to. I try to. <laughs> that's pretty cool. We, we've heard Kigley say, right? talking about the, the pressure differences and how it can shorten the life of your transmission, but you don't realize like where those pressure differences come from and what's causing them. And I, you know, when you explain it like that, I think that that makes it pretty, even, even someone who, who's not as familiar with automatic transmission, you can kind of see like, Oh, okay, well, you know, this is what's causing this and this is what's causing that. Yep, exactly. I mean, that's, the biggest thing is, I'll say, theory of operation, right? And, and I, you can take that all the way back to when I was in, in tech school, um, at the vocational tech school, right? It's if you don't try to sit down and figure out exactly how it's working or supposed to be working, it becomes really difficult to figure out what the problem is when something isn't working at the end, right? right. Makes it when, when everything in the middle the is, yeah, when it's when it's a black box in the middle, it, it gets it gets very difficult. So. <laughs> Um, and again, getting this information out there for everybody, especially with the the growing number of auto builds and people, you know, really, really pushing them. You know, the the smarter we can we can be, um, and keep people from making some of the mistakes, right? The the better off we all are. Yeah. And it, it's you know obviously we have a fear of all the planetaries running out and um, you know possibly putting it into all of our racing careers, but it's nice that, like you said, some stuff within the transmission we can source from outside OEM parts and, and keep at least that part alive for a while. Yep, exactly. So Andrew, we've heard on here a few times, uh, people say, uh, talking through their setup, Oh, well, you know, I'm running the, 
the TPE shift kit. So let's talk about the cars currently running your shift kit that we could see in action, you know, for most of us probably at the shootout. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's uh, quite a few cars um, with, with kits installed and running them. Cause that's the caveat, right? right. People buy yep. parts, but don't necessarily put them on. Um, you know, we've already talked about uh, Troy Wallace there a little bit earlier. Um, a couple guys that you've actually interviewed, I think it was, geez, not even back to back, but yeah, you know, Kevin Collins from Early Performance, um, and, and Brandon Mao, right, the Specs Ops uh, Racing. Yeah. So, you know, definitely two two fast guys that are definitely taxing their transmissions and, and using their their shift kits to the fullest. So, um, the, uh, we call Street Thirty Two winner and runner up. We should point out. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. They were they were the finalists of this past year's shootout. So it was awesome to watch and, and cheer on. So that was for me as a you know, knowing that I've got parts in both those cars, I was like, Man, this is this is so this freaking is awesome gets, to yeah. watch. Um Yeah, uh Jared McCargo, Black Mamba, you know, he's an early performance customer. He's got uh got a valve body for me. Um did Chris Mauder's valve body here not too long ago. Uh Tony Marks has a kit. I don't think he's installed it yet. The guy's been lazy or something. I don't know. Racing all the time. Crazy guy. <laughs> Crazy. I don't know. Just kidding, Tony. He missed World Cup, so he must be getting lazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What are you doing over there? He's probably, he's probably rooting for the Ravens right now. So, um, But actually, I've got quite a few shift kits, uh, you know, internationally, too, right? Kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. But uh, Mo from AZM Performance in Malaysia. Um. So he runs a, a Mitsubishi shop out there. He has a kit and an auto swapped Evo, early Evo. Um, Chris Payne from Australia, he's doing a cyborg build, which is pretty pretty badass. Absolutely. Um, but that's he's got one of my my shift kits. I don't think he's ran it yet, as far as I know. I know he's been he's been super busy, but um, but keep an eye out for for his setup. That should be that should be a pretty pretty cool car. Um, Jeremy Prakash, aka J Man Keith. Oh, nice. Um, he's, he's pretty pretty active on the auto Facebook groups. But he's got a, you know an, an eight second auto swap Evo in Australia. Um, worked with him quite a bit uh, with his setup on his car, just because of of what it is. I mean, it's a, it's a lot uh, it's a lot more horsepower than you know my personal car. So that uh, definitely some good data, and you know can work with him, and and he's he's a good sport. So. You know, getting pressure balance data has been great. Um, and actually, he's he's liked it enough that he's kind of, uh, I want to say a vendor, but um, he's been kind of buying, um, you know, parts in bulk. That oh, way wow. he can he can sell them to the guys down under. That's killer. Um, and just save, save them on shipping and duties. So I was I was all for it. I'm like, absolutely. Help, help get it out, you know, get the word out and help those guys over there get their cars, um, you know, more reliable and, and shifting better. For so. sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I expect some big numbers from him here soon, as as well as the customers that he's working with. But uh, yeah, I mean, all in all, it's been great seeing the progress over the last two and a half years from you know from the product and and the racers who are who are using it and you know posting up time slips. Heck yeah, man, that's awesome. Going uh, globally. Yeah, yeah. I actually um, sold a kit earlier. A few months back now, uh, to a guy over in the UK, which I know their Mitsubishi scene is interesting. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know a whole lot about it, um, but I was intrigued when he when he contacted me and for sure. Um, yeah, kind of see what's what's going on over there on on the European side. So heck yeah, well, that's freaking awesome. I. I can't wait to see some more of those cars in action yeah me too i, I don't know if the australians need to be any faster though they're already kind of kicking our butts everywhere <laughs> i know they, they do a pretty good job of it so but when they call when they call you mate it just makes you feel like you're part of the team exactly yeah i usually say <laughs> cheers anyways just because i feel like that's what everybody says yeah exactly <laughs> so andrew what does the future of tau performance engineering look like well, with it being just a, I'll say a, a fun side gig, right? I mean, I don't have very firm or lofty goals, but uh, I would like to continue these oddball requests and, and helping the, the community 
out. So I'm passionate about the platform and I want to keep them relevant as, as long as I can. Right. If I can, if I can make that little bit of a difference, then I, I want to, um, you know, I do get asked quite a bit if I am trying to go full time or, you know, things like that. And, and maybe there's a future where I take the, the Reed Lundy plunge and just <laughs> quote unquote, do it for a living. Yeah. Um, but you know, the golden handcuffs are definitely real. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you know, I do want to start investing more in equipment, um, rely a little bit less on some of the, some of my suppliers for some things. Um, it allowed me to open up quite a few doors. So for instance, I'm looking into uh, a small CNC mill, um, to take some of these creations, right. That are designed and, and printed and, and quickly mill them up. Um, again, I, in my own, in my own hands. Yeah. Um, you know, currently I leverage some of our local, I got some local machinists and fabricators and, and they're great to work with. Um, you know, but from a business perspective, you know, outsourcing and insourcing, it's uh, it's a balance, right? So I think there's some opportunity to insource and, and maybe uh, take things a little bit further. So. And instead of having to rely on a, a third party company to answer the questions for you, now you can find your own answers. Exactly. That's killer. So Andrew, what products and services will TPE offer in the future that you don't currently offer? Well, I try to do my best at monitoring and engaging in the community and see what, you know, parts or kits they're wanting or needing. Um, I also keep in close contact with Mitsubishi OEM parts to stay on top of what's going obsolete. Mm -hmm. So, um, hopefully in the next few months, I'd like to have replacement parts for some items on these transmissions, the F and W 4A33s that Mitsubishi has or is nearing discontinuation on. So um, the, the, the prime example is the, the main and lower valve body separator or orifice plates. We talked about those earlier. Um, the, you know, the lower valve body one is, is fully obsolete right now. So wow. if one is damaged enough, I have to go through the core pile and try to find one that's, you know, decent not as um, bad. The, yeah the mains are getting thin um i think personally i'm driving demand for mitsubishi's parts um production because there's times that i call to get some ordered and they tell me they're back ordered and there's times i call and they say we got three in stock and we can have you know two more in a week and i'm like all right <laughs> wow. so like i said those are those are a wearable item right especially in stock form, um, whether that's check balls damaging them um, or if you're doing an install of a shift kit yourself and you drill the wrong hole, right? Now you're either trying to over drill and swedge and redrill um, to make it right again. <laughs> it's, it's risky, right? So, um, but I'm trying to work on getting some laser cut remakes of those done up and it'd be great if I can have that kind of ready to go for everybody here um like i said over the next few months so another item um that could be coming soon if there's enough interest is kind of putting together a, a more defined kit um for that rd port mod oh, um nice. and maybe even comboing it with the shift kits kind of making it an all-inclusive you know this is the valve body this is the um you know hoses and fittings and you know if you're going to run a control valve so you can regulate converter pressure and kind of put that all together. Um, this has kind of been stemming from people that are trying to do these mods and struggling with finding the right information to perform the modification and what parts to use. Yeah. So if you're listening and this sounds interesting to you, DM me. We can chat about it. Um, maybe maybe try to put some kind of kit together that can uh, kind of help everybody out that is kind of reaching that point where they're like, yeah, I really need to look into doing this because I'm taxing this transmission hard, right? And I don't want to keep hurting things if I don't have to. Right. So, you know, I used to keep a running list of parts that I wanted to make kits. I want to offer. Um, but it's one of those things where I either need to buckle down and get some of it done (laughs) and out there or keep letting the market dictate what to work on next. Right. So reality says it's a balance, but you know, maybe the listeners can help with what they want to see coming down the pipeline. I mean, I know planetaries is a, a hot topic. Um, I will say that I have not, turned a blind eye to it. Um, I mean, you and I talked at, at PRI, Josh, about this. Yeah. Um, you know, 
this is probably going to become a collaborative effort more than likely. Yeah. So I know Christian Lucido had his Brenna helical, you know, planets that he was trying to get made. I know that's on hold right now. Um, well, we're definitely gonna have to figure something out Some as a, out. as a group more than likely. Right. So those of us that have the, the means and capability, we're probably going to have to, to team up on this one is, is my guess. But, um, yeah, I mean, from the Mitsubishi side, that's definitely the the hotter topics there. Yeah, we're we're coming to a point where we gotta we're gonna have to take a fork on the road. Either we all work together and solve this problem, or it just becomes even bigger of a problem. Right, right, and that's that's what I don't want to see. Yeah. So, Andrew, what is it that sets Tal apart from other performance industry companies? I would say that what makes TP stand out, um, you know, it's purely just the level of passion for performance and the want to ensure that everything being done or made is is of the utmost standards, um, whether it's customer service or part quality. Um, I mean, I inspect every part made, whether it's outsourced or made in my thousand square foot shop. Um, I only sell what's right. So, yeah. and I'm also not just selling you a part. I'm selling you my knowledge and my support. Um, you can ask any person who's bought a kit or sent me their valve body for service that I try to be very communicative and transparent and do my best to make sure that you're getting the best combo for your build goals and, and usage, right? Even years after your purchase. Um, I do feel like some places get caught up in, in the nameless customer interactions, and I try to make sure everyone feels that they are part of the team, right? they should feel comfortable working with you. And that makes the entire transaction much more streamlined. Yeah. So, you know, um, TP is not a parts pushing company. I have no desire to ship hundreds of parts a day. Right. Um, again, it, it, it is a, it is a, a side job. So a more of a service oriented business. I want to consult you and your build and help you find your best solution. And, and sometimes that may very well include not using me or my products. If mm -hmm. that's, what makes the most sense, right? I want you to be successful in your project and goals. Yeah. I mean, if that's what it comes down to, that's what it comes down to, right? Exactly. Yep. So Andrew, you're most well known for your, uh, white one G. Um, you know, we consider this the shop car. So I, I want to talk about the shop car because it's, it's going through some, uh, some, some changes it is it is yeah so yeah i mean for those who i guess want a deeper history tune in to mid two times podcast episode 25 yep. um <laughs> shameless plug <laughs> no uh, <laughs> but you know, ultimately like i do have two cars um you know the race and development car right the shop car we'll call it the the 93 talent all-wheel drive obviously an auto car um that's what i've learned so much on right it's yeah. it's my my test bed, it's my Jack Stan Warrior, it's my kryptonite. Um, <laughs> you know, previously I was trying to make some waves with stock frame turbo, and, you know, the car performed well, um, but it started running into, you know, multiple issues that just kept me from progressing. Um, back in 2021, things were looking really bright. I mean, knocked off a 963 at 140 with the FP Black at 32 pounds. Um, and that was like, man, there's there's still a lot going on here. Like we haven't even like really leaned on this thing yet. So um, 2022 and 2023 seasons were not so generous because as <laughs> we found issues and tried to address things and tried to push, you know, a little bit harder. And, and I will admit um, I was falling into my own trap of, of staring at that FP black record and just licking my chops Um but it, it just, it only dug the hole deeper um, to the point that, you know, last season I ended up going to a full turbo swap with a different brand of stock frame turbo. Um, and that, that didn't end so well. Um, I'm sure many witnessed that the shootout. Um, but at this point, it's kind of, it's kind of taken a big step back with the car. Um, kind of want to try to be more competitive in that, 64 millimeter space um i know the uh 
the, the times will say, why are you messing with some whole turbo stuff still? But at the same time, right, I, I know what my, my, my budget is and capability to maintain the car. Right. So, um, so I'm trying to really simplify it and reduce failure points. Um, so, I mean, if you recall, right, Josh, that car was, it was a max effort build for around, sure. the, around the turbo, right? It was a 59 millimeter turbo and we're talking methanol, dual injectors, you know, the sheer air to water intercooler. I mean, everything from weight savings I could get out of the car. Yep. I mean, it was, what can we do? to just push this thing as far as we can. And, and, and the combo was there. It just kept finding other problems <laughs> that had to, had to overcome. Yeah. So and, it's and, like, you know what? I, I want to race, right? Exactly. Um, I want to go rounds again. I, I have, you know, I have things that I can learn on my car, but I, now I kind of have a, a customer base too, that is, great and willing to work with me and right we can push things together right with that understanding yeah. so um you know me trying to go and build a, a six second auto car right now doesn't doesn't do me any any good really right um so focusing i think on this and making my car more of a get it down the track make it go rounds um i, I would i would like to see if i could be you know, mean street world cup finals competitive. Yes, sir. Um, that's, that's going to be kind of dictated upon, I'll say future rule changes. If anything like that occurs, um, that class is definitely tough for an all wheel drive auto, you know, DSM to compete in with the turbo sizing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but we'll see. I mean, if, if, if it's not really truly competitive, that combo will still be, you know, it'll still be fun for a straight 32 shootout class. It'll still be great for um, some of the local um, events. Yeah. Um, even IFO, I mean, it takes you out of FIS and into FIP, but um, depending on the event and who shows up, you might get lucky. So, <laughs> never know. Yeah. So it, it'll be down for a while, um, but th- that's okay. It, it, it gives a. Uh, it gives me some time to really think and take what I've learned over the last almost 19 years of DSMing <laughs> and uh, really, really think about what's going to be the best thing to do, right? Yeah. And keep the car simple. So, um, but yeah, so there's that. And then I also have my Evo 8. It's an 03. Um, you know, I've raced that car quite a bit, especially early on. But now I try to reserve it for cruising around town with the family and, and hitting local car meets. So, um, but for what it's worth, with the talent being down, I do plan on knocking the dust off of it some and, and attempting to maybe podium at max effort at the shootout this next year. So yeah. um, I think with a few tweaks, it should be competitive. Um, I mean, I've all across the car some, and I'm pretty comfortable in the seat. So we'll see. So maybe that car will get some love this year <laughs> for the most part. Hell yeah. And plus, I mean, you know, if you take a shot for the, uh, you know, World Cup stage, I mean, if there's anything else to squeeze out of your products, at least you'll be able to learn it there. I mean, uh, we saw Kevin last year at World Cup using your shift kit and and did absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he was probably the only person there to come on an open trailer and, you know, didn't have a big crew and showed up and went rounds and it was amazing to watch. Yeah, Kevin's Kevin's a beast. That guy's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, to to, uh, to put your products on that kind of stage, that that's that's really as good as it gets, in my opinion. Yeah, I I, I agree. When he when he told me that he was he was getting the car set up for for World Cup, I was like, yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> I mean, it's also awesome for you because you get to go out there, see how your product performs at such a high level. And, uh, you know, I'm sure people listen to this. Maybe they know, maybe they don't. But, you know, also it's, it's, it's hard for the autos there because we don't get to use nitrous. So you get to kind of see what your product does out of its comfort zone. And I think that's really cool too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Andrew, let's talk about TPE's goals for 2024. 
For sure. Um, I would say, you know, probably going to be heavily focused on, on product development and trying to help out racers, you know, who have or, or want shift kits um, or any other part they need. So with the Talon Rebuild, um, it's going to allow me to focus more on that and, and some of the side business and less on trying to, you know, race. Um, you know, you only get so many hours in the day, right? So if I'm if I'm trying to get my own car put together and, and ready for a race weekend, right, that's just it's time away from working on, you know, designing a product or, you know, trying to get supplier quotes yeah. or, you know, whatever. So, um, I mean, it would be great to have three to maybe four new products out over the course of the year. Um, so stuff that I've been been juggling. Um, like I said earlier, I want I definitely want to engage the racers here and, and find out what they what they need. Right. And try to make that happen. So that's that's what I would like to see here over the next the next year. Thank you. So, Andrew, what events can we uh, see you at, at in 2024? What, what events can we see you in person and ask you some questions? Yeah, uh, I got a short list of events that I'm trying to get to. So obviously the shootout, um, I'll never miss that. Uh, unlike a David Griffiths guy, he's been in like five weddings and shootout weekends. <laughs> atrocious. Um, <laughs> uh, I do want to make it to World Cup this year just as a spectator. I want to experience it, um, yeah. especially if, the, if I'm going to get my car competitive for it. I need I need to go. I need to go sniff some things out. Feel it so, out, yeah. um, but really, I plan on crewing for our, our local racers, right? The uh, the Club Diamond Star guys. So. Um, got some events that we're planning on um four or five ifos in the area so um the two i think we're trying to hit the two at hebron um the one at the dragway 42 um we're talking about heading over to illinois for the ones over there because it's not too too bad of a drive so there's basically the ones kind of right around indiana here um we're trying to hit um, we also have the whole shot media series at Muncie Dragway, um, so go out there and we should hopefully have at least a couple guys that are are running out there. I plan on on helping out. So I mean, if you're in that Indiana, Ohio, Michigan area, and you come to any of these, you'll you'll probably see me probably see me there. Heck yeah. Do you guys uh, usually do a streetcar takeover Indy or no? Um, we we haven't. Um, we talked about trying to head down this year um especially with with dave's car being uh a, a real good 11.5 index competitive car um so i think i think we're gonna try because I, I, I are they doing one or two this year i know uh, at one point they're trying to do two a year yeah i thought I th- all i saw was one indy one cincy so I'm, I'm not sure okay yeah the indy one's usually in july i think yeah pick the hottest time of the year yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i guess we can't complain it doesn't get that super hot around here yeah it's no it's no florida oppression that's yeah. for sure yeah absolutely so andrew where can we find and follow tp on social media well you can follow tau performance engineering on facebook um and instagram uh or you can follow me directly at Andrew Welling on Facebook and Instagram. Um, although my personal stuff is, it is about 95% car related. Uh, when it's volleyball season, like now, it'll, it'll, that'll consume it for a few months. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do have the website for, for TPE. It's not a clean URL because I have been a little lazy and haven't bought a domain. Um, <laughs> maybe we can just link that in the show notes. But, uh, yeah, we can do that. Um, but it's definitely best to contact me I would say Facebook DMs through the TPE page or email me um, directly at info.taupperfengr at gmail.com. Um, I monitor those the closest for all my, my business-related inquiries. Just it helps me keep things organized that way. Heck yeah. So, Andrew, as you know, at the end, I always give people a chance to give a thanks or a shout out to anybody who's helped them get where they are, help, uh, you know, get the shop where it is. Is there anybody that you want to give a shout out to? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, huge shout out to my wife, Michelle. She's always supporting me and knows how much I enjoy racing and engineering and and helping everybody out. So, um, obviously, she gets 
gets top props. Um, but, uh, you know, big thanks to you, Josh, for always looking out for us little guys. And, uh, you know, those of us who are trying to keep racing the Mitsubishi in existence. So, you know, the podcast, the list, all the recognition, it really gives everyone an, an outlet. And that's fantastic. So, appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Huge thanks for that. Um, definitely want to shout out to, to my suppliers that help me with, you know, parts or services that I don't have, you know, in-house. I'm only as good as the, the team that encircles me, right? So, um, can't can't do it without without them. So, um, but, I've, you know, I've been shaped by, by many people and, and businesses, both in and out of the performance industry. And, and I think that has, has helped out a lot, too. So, you know, guys like Josh at, at Helltech, you know, he's a huge influencer um you know just learning you know from him the the ins and outs of the performance industry uh the the advice means a lot to me so um you know my buddy eric hazen at varus engineering talked about him earlier right uh my engineering team within eaton um and, and the local club diamond star crew you know some of them are small business owners like jared griffiths the the famous purple 2g car show winner from the yep. shootout um, you know, he, he always has great advice and insights, whether I'm trying to determine if something is financially feasible or, or how to best handle the ever changing <laughs> customer market. Right. So, I mean, even a, a one man business still has a team of people that are supporting them. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to be where I'm at today without everybody else's help and support and, and advice. So, I mean, thank, thanks to everybody, right. For, for, for helping me and, and I'll, I'll continue to help you. Heck yeah. Awesome, Andrew. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on here to tell the story of Tau Performance Engineering, and uh, I hope that we can get you some more business and uh, make you uh, maybe persuade you sooner to uh, make the leap to doing this full time. Yeah, Josh, I, I appreciate it, man. Thanks, thanks for having me again. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Talk to you later. Have a good one. You too. Thank you for listening to the Mitsu Times podcast. Check out our Instagram and Facebook for daily updates. Get added to our list by going to mitsutimes.org and clicking submit a slip. Thank you to all of our sponsors.